guys, good evening. Um, thank you to um, another JavaScript episode. It's really nice to see some familiar names that I know and also some new names as well. Um, so this is going to be another episode of our JavaScript um, live series. Um, in case you don't know, I'm Lois um, and I look after our front end JavaScript roles here for companies in London, but also that hire remotely across Europe. Um, today's talk is co-hosted by Jan Salo. He's a staff engineer at Box um, and is going to be giving us a talk today around how to navigate your career as an individual contributor. Um, the session is designed to be quite interactive as possible, really. Me and Jan Salo will be going back and forth with, with conversation, but he's the expert, so he'll be leading it pretty much. Um, we have some save some time at the end, specifically four questions. Um, but if you feel like you've got a burning question, it can't wait until then, use the um, Q&A section below um, and I will address them. Um, but yeah, try and save your questions to the end. Um, we can hopefully address everything there. Enough from me. Thank you, um, Jan Salo, for joining us and feel free to get going whenever you're ready. Cool. Thank you, Lois. Uh, yes, my name is Gonzalo Bebiglia. A little bit of introduction about me. I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I relocated to the Netherlands five years ago. I got an engineer's degree from the University of Buenos Aires, and I have been working professionally as a software engineer in different kinds of companies, uh, from consulting firms to product companies based in Latin America, Europe, and the US, uh, mostly. I currently work at Box as a staff software engineer, focusing mostly on our e-signature uh, product. And a little bit uh, about me on a personal level, I am married, I'm the father of four cats. Uh, two of them are here with me in the Netherlands and two are with my parents-in-law back in Buenos Aires. I like to barbecue, especially with this lovely weather that we have here in Amsterdam at the moment. Um, I enjoy drinking wine, whiskey, and I consider myself a foodie. Over the course of my career, I have witnessed a lot of different career ladders, ways of setting objectives, ways of working to deliver software, and ways in which all of this come together for a promotion. Um, and in this webinar together with Lois, I'll share some of the learnings and things I believe are relevant when thinking about your career. The content I'll speak about will be divided into six small categories, let's call them. I'll start by talking about the five types of skills one needs to develop in order to grow in the software engineering industry. We'll then follow with a typical career ladder that can be found in most companies from junior engineer to principal, fellow, and infinity and beyond. Uh, then, yeah, we'll, I'll try to stop here and there to see if there are any open questions just to make it interactive. Otherwise, we'll, we'll go until the end. Then I'll cover the four career paths that I consider are, I don't know, the more distinguishable an engineer can, can take as they grow, as they grow. Some of the challenges engineers have to face throughout their, throughout their career. And um, the last two parts, I'll start by giving six examples of career opportunities we can leverage uh, throughout our journey. And I'll finish with five uh, personal tips you can use to build your promotion case and plan your career. How does that sound, Lois? Good? Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. All right. So let's get started. People starting to appear a little bit more. Let's start with the skills that software engineers need to develop and demonstrate to advance their careers. Being able to show these skills is an important part. I will we'll cover more about it uh, later. One thing is to say you have them. And another thing is for people to be able to tell them apart. Um, the most obvious one people might think about is technical skills. These are the skills that software engineers use to design, develop, and maintain software systems and applications. Uh, they include programming language, frameworks, frameworks, tools, algorithms, data structures. They vary depending on domain, industry, and project requirements, um, but they are the most common skills one thinks about and the ones we usually uh, prepare for an interview. In my opinion, this is an important yet small set of skills uh, one should nurture. Uh, we then have 
communication skills that for the time being, software engineering is done by humans until AI takes over. So we need to communicate effectively with different stakeholders, such as clients, users, managers, colleagues, uh, other engineers. And these skills involve being able to understand and convey technical concepts in a clear and concise manner, asking relevant questions, listening actively, giving and receiving feedback, and adapting to different communication styles and preferences, using appropriate tone and using an appropriate language, depending on the environment. The next one uh, I consider very important is our leadership skills. Um, and these are the, the skills that we use to lead projects, initiatives, or teams, and ensure the quality and reliability of software systems and applications. They include planning, organizing, making decisions, solving problems at a higher level and motivating others. Um, they're also about being able to define and communicate the vision and goals of the project or team that is working on something. Resolving conflicts, resolving issues that arise and inspiring and empowering others to achieve their full potential. Then we have the strategic skills that we need to align our technical solutions with the business goals and objectives of our larger organization or clients. Uh, this involves being able to understand and anticipate the needs and expectations of users or customers, identifying and evaluating the opportunities and challenges in the market or industry, and designing and implementing software solution, solutions that provide a competitive uh, advantage. Uh, how we are going to measure and improve uh, the impact and the outcomes of our software solution, not just ship it and call it a day. For the last one uh, I selected, we have the mentorship skills, which enable engineers to essentially multiply themselves. It's a, it's a weird term, but uh, we use mentorship skills to share our knowledge and expertise with other engineers and help them grow in their own careers kind of like a win-win situation here. This, this can happen in the form of teaching, coaching, advising, or just being present as a rubber duck that people talk to while they solve their own problems. Uh, they involve being able to identify and assess the strengths and weaknesses of other engineers, providing constructive feedback and guidance on their work or career development goals, uh, offering resources or even opportunities for learning or improvement creating and building trusting relationships with them based on mutual respect and understanding. And I, I wanted to highlight these five, let's say, sets of skills, because I think they are very relevant um, in what we see as a typical career ladder in, in software engineering uh, companies. So before talking about career levels, I want to do a big clarification that the Titles or names are going to mention are not universal names. Some companies go for numbers, some have way more subdivision between, between levels. Um, but I, I think it's still useful to understand the progression of the needed skills uh, that I mentioned before, and not as an ultimate guide to titles themselves. Uh, each company can have their own motivation for the title uh, they put or how often they promote. Maybe they charge their own customers because of the title of engineers um, that are sub-hired or things like that. I don't want to get into that. Just understand a, a very common progression of a career ladder in software engineering. As um, an entry-level position, we usually have the, the junior software engineer. These are uh, people who have recently graduated from a degree or a coding bootcamp or have less than two years of professional experience to just to put a number. Um, the important part is that this, this, this type of engineers usually work on well-defined tasks and follow established standards and practices. They, they usually need to develop their technical skills as they are just learning them, their communication skills and problem solving skills to advance to the, le to the next level. Um, the scope of their work is usually one task at a time and having impact uh, across their nearest, let's say, team. 
Uh, on the next level, we, we can have the Meteor uh, software engineer, which is an intermediate level position. People who have more years of experience and have already demonstrated proficiency in their technical uh, domain. They work with minimal guidance and can handle complex tasks independently or as part of a team. And they can design, implement, and maintain software that meets certain requirements and, and expectations from clients or users. They contribute to, to code reviews, to documentation, testing, debugging. And in order to advance to the next level, they need to show more leadership skills, more strategic thinking, and a little bit of mentorship too, just to set a, a good example uh, for the previous levels. The scope of their work is usually one sprint at a time, two weeks, three weeks, a month, depending. And again, the impact is still at a team level, although you can have spikes where you collaborate with others. Then we have the senior software engineer after that, that it's a more advanced level position for um, software engineers that have already shown excellence in their technical domain. Um, they are responsible for leading projects, leading whole initiatives or even teams and ensuring, not only contributing, but ensuring the quality and reliability of software systems. They are, they are able to architect if needed uh, or optimize existing software systems. And they are able to provide guidance, feedback and coach, coaching is expected to junior or media engineers. And in order to progress, they need to develop a little bit more their leadership skills, their technical skills, sometimes depending on the company and uh, communication skills in order to be more effective and increase uh, their impact and scope. And for senior software engineer, the scope is usually one, one quarter at a time, maybe two in some sections or, or less, depending on the team and company. And um, the following um, title we usually have is a staff software engineer. I'm at that point uh, at this moment. Um, this is a more, it's considered a little bit expert uh, level for people who have more than eight, 10, depending on the company years of professional experience and have achieved uh, a high level of recognition and can demonstrate the impact they had in the technical, in their technical domain. Um, they are usually the technical leaders of the organizations and drive the technical direction and culture. They can, they can create, improve and scale software systems as before, uh, but the, the impact the systems have are, are usually uh, higher, maybe impacting the whole, a whole area of business or part of the general external industry, even by contributing to external projects. Uh, they are also required to mentor, coach, and inspire other engineers across teams, not, not just one team, but multiple teams and departments. And in order to progress, again, they need to develop more mentorship skills, more strategic, and being able to lead a larger um, group of people under their guidance, so to say. Their vision and strategy and scope of work is between a quarter or and a year with division, organization, and community impact, usually. And for the next um, two uh, titles, uh, I think are usual. I don't have hands-on experience myself. I haven't reached there yet, but I've seen multiple people that have been my mentors throughout uh, the year, so I kind of understand what their role looks like, but not to a low level detail. So if you have a question about the next two, I can I can guide you or give you an idea, but I cannot answer with certainty. Uh, the next one we have after staff is usually the principal software engineer, who is usually a subject matter expert of a key domain or whole tech stack. They are able to anticipate industry trends where the software industry is going, um, the vision and strategy for them is usually beyond one year, and they for sure impact the whole organization together with uh, a portion of the industry. And beyond that, there's usually multiple after, depending on the company, but some people call it distinguished, some people call it fellow, um, and these are 
people that have pioneered new technologies, are leading experts in the industry, maybe even famous on Twitter, I don't know. Um, but they have launched and designed major parts of infrastructure, systems, products, uh, and their vision and strategies way beyond the three-year mark. Uh, they own multiple domains and they themselves are able to change or affect the direction of where the industry is going just by their weight of their own influence. So these were the first two topics. I don't know, Lois, if you have any pressing questions. If not, I will just continue. Um, yeah, no questions from me and there's not any in the Q&A for now. So unless anyone has got wants to, oh, here we've oh, well. got a question. Um, someone just mentioned, um, could you just clarify the next topic as they couldn't, um, as they couldn't get, they couldn't get you. I don't really know the what. Current they, or the future topics? I don't know. I don't really know what they mean. Could you just. I can reiterate of what this talk will be all about. I already covered a set of skills that are important for software engineers to grow in their career. If you want to grow, some people really are comfortable where they are and they don't want to progress. Um, that was the first topic I, I covered. Then we followed with uh, a little bit of a typical career ladder, how it looks like from junior to medior to senior, these common names we give each other and how they relate to the skills I mentioned before. And from now onwards, I will talk about different career paths that are available for us software engineers, different sets of challenges that we have to face if we plan to remain uh, in the industry for a large, long number of years. Um, and then some career opportunities that you can use to, to grow your career and uh, some tips that I will share about building your promotion case and making sure others see the value you think you have. Perfect. Thank you. Hopefully that answers your question a little bit, a little bit more. Um, but I'll let you progress on to the next topic and then any more questions we can come back to after. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, yeah, next topic I have is four career paths. I think um, could be your choice if you want to grow. Uh, the one I was focusing more in terms of the ladder is the technical leadership uh, paths for software engineers who want to become technical leaders either in their organization or even the whole industry. Um, this path typically involves moving up the individual contributor ladder. This called individual contributor because, I don't know, uh, that's the name they put it, but once you go beyond media or even senior, it's not about you anymore. You really need to influence uh, others. But yeah, it goes, as I mentioned before, from junior to senior to staff to distinguished. And yeah, these leaders are responsible for driving the technical direction uh, and vision of their projects. The other ladder that you could uh, choose if it suits you is the engineering management uh, path. This is the path for software engineers who want to transition into uh, a little bit more people management and let's say fewer leadership roles, more, more traditional in that sense. Um, and this, this path usually involves moving from a senior engineer role to an engineering manager role. And then from there, you get titles like director, uh, vice president of engineering or CTO, if you reach that point or you'll found your own company, I guess. Um, and engineering managers are responsible for leading, managing and developing being teams uh, or groups of software engineers. Uh, they also oversee planning, execution, and the actual delivery of the projects, ensuring alignment with the rest of the business goals and objectives. Uh, this path has a very high focus on people and organizational problems, although you need to have a technical background. Um, there is a lot to be learned in this path. It's not a, uh, for, for some, it is a natural progression. Uh, they just get interested in this kind of topics and uh, they capitalize on an opportunity. Um, and a lot of this, uh, of people that follow this path have the ability to pendulum, so to say, back and forth. Uh, this and the individual contributor uh, path, bringing with them a lot of knowledge and different points of view. They are able to empathize with 
kind of both sides uh, of the ladder, which is pretty important sometimes. Um, then a little bit in the middle of these two, we have the hybrid path, which is the one software engineers takes to balance both the technical and managerial responsibilities. This, this path typically involves moving again from a senior engineer uh, role to a tech lead or lead engineer, whatever the name they want to put it, um, and then to an engineering manager or senior engineering manager, if you wanted to, uh, but some uh, retain the title of engineer and just kind of work with a sp split brain between these two uh, roles. And this type of leaders are responsible for both designing and implementing software solutions, as well as leading, managing, and growing groups uh, of peoples. And yeah, they act as liaisons between technical and non-technical stakeholders because they kind of uh, feel very comfortable doing wearing kind of both hats. Um, and then this is not a path that is usually common for people working in a particular, let's say, company, but uh, you always have the option to go kind of freelancer or, or contract if you want to have more flexibility or autonomy in your work, um, working as independent contractor or even a, a consultant in a specific uh, firm that helps you sell your service. And you usually work on a project by project uh, basis. And uh, this doesn't exempt uh, engineers from delivering high quality software or meeting clients requirements or uh, their expectations. It's just how um, you work on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is that's different. And maybe, yeah, if you want to go full freelance or contractor besides management or technical leadership, some business skills uh, might come in handy. You will be able, you will need to eventually, I guess, if you want to grow, uh, pay somebody else's salary if you have too much uh, work and that I know nothing about. I received my pay slip, I can read it, and that's all my knowledge on the subject. Um, for the next kind of topic, we have uh, some challenges that we face uh, in this industry. Um, the first one that I think it's relevant, and I, I, I believe many of you might feel the same, is the rapid technological development our industry have has. Sorry, uh, we are uh, we operate in a dynamic and evolving field that requires us to keep up with the latest technology and trends. We need to constantly learn new skills and tools and adapt to changing requirements and expectations. Uh, the suggestion I have for this challenge is to treat your knowledge as you would treat an investment portfolio. There is an opportunity cost in learning something new versus deepening your knowledge around something you already know. Diversification of skills is good, but you might not want to be stretched too thin. The second challenge we have is being data-driven. Sometimes it is not easy to put a number around your contributions or collaboration. Do you measure lines of code? How many JIRA tickets you completed? Um, as you have to assume always that the data you, you, you provide for your, let's say, promotion case or whatever, will be assessed by a non-technical person, even if it is. If you work on, an, on a refactor, let's say, to simplify code, work on a narrative about how other features were able to ship faster. How did you uh, impact the business by your technical contribution, so to say? Um, then we have time limitations. We, we operate in a deadline-driven field. Many times it requires us to, to complete projects or, tough or tasks within a given time frame. Sometimes the time frame is kind of self-imposed by the business. Sometimes it's a legal requirement. Sometimes it's the technology you use reaches end of life and you cannot use it um, anymore. But managing time is a, it's a very big challenge that we need to overcome. Uh, and the last two I have are a little bit more soft skill uh, oriented too. The first one is uh, feedback. We, um, the software engineering itself is a feedback based uh, field. We receive and give feedback constantly uh, on a daily basis on code reviews, then quarterly or yearly in our performance uh, review. So we need to be able, we need to feel comfortable about both giving and receiving feedback in one-on-ones, 
in code reviews, in customer feedback, getting a bad review from our customer. We are overexposed uh, to feedback. And the last one, maybe people a little bit controversial, but I think it's very predominant. Uh, I've seen it uh, in many places, is politics. Um, we work, we operate in a collaborative field uh, that requires us to work with different stake stakeholders. And we need to navigate the politics and dynamics of the organization we operate in. Some companies operate in, uh, in one way, some on the other. Um, and this, this is a particularly tricky one because sometimes it's not written down. It's just how the company ends up behaving, even though it says something different, maybe in their mission statement or values, or it's just that your reporting line just have a certain way of operating. Um, let's do a quick stop now for the question that's there. We've got like one. To read it. Yeah, I've got one. I have got one question that's come up in the Q and A box. I just wanted to, like, I guess, highlight a couple of things. Um, I really liked how you you mentioned as like when you're like doing you know, like migrations and stuff. Um, you want to talk about the the benefit that has to other features. Obviously, I speak with people every day to understand what it is that you've done. What is it you've done, and how has this benefited? The, the wider business and that's something I really try to draw out of people and sometimes people kind of leave behind us like oh I, I created reusable components okay that's brilliant but what has that actually done for the business and like how you know how was that added value so I think yeah that's a really good um point to address and I like how you said um treat your skills as like an investment portfolio you want to invest in a, a wide range of things but yeah you need to invest enough in some things to actually have a good return so yeah some really insightful points thank you we have got one question that somebody um asked a while ago but i just left it until now we kind of like covered it at the start but it's a, a good question that people um will always answer so they said um would a senior or mid-level in one company be considered the same at another or the levels generally defined from within a company? Yeah, I would say in general terms, no. Each company decides what uh, label they they put in their engineers and what skills they value. There are still some companies in which titles are, are kind of similar depending on um, the size of the company or, or what industry you operate in. I'm going to give a, a random example because I know it, I, I've heard it is this way, but I, I don't have first-hand experience. I can imagine if you're a, I don't know, senior level person in Microsoft with their size, you could be considered a senior level person maybe in Google or, or Apple or something like that. But I learned this firsthand in my career. I was coming from a kind of small startup. I had like the title of architect there, super, super high level. And then when I went to, a, this was like a startup of, let's say, 100 people. And when I transitioned to a larger company that had like 2,000 engineers, I was quickly, <laughs> I faced the reality that I was not even a senior. I was not happy uh, about it, but it was a, a learning. And I, I worked myself up a different uh, career ladder. And I think what, what Lois mentioned here is important. And it's also about what you're able to show uh, that you did, that you accomplished during the interview too. Okay, you have a super high title, but can you really tell me uh, what you achieved that made you gain this title or position? Perfect, thank you. Um, I probably would say, I guess like generally, um, you know, there is, I guess a, a guideline of like years of experience. So typically companies would see someone as a senior from about five years experience. That is just, I guess, a very general benchmark. And again, you'll probably generally be a, go from a junior to a mid-level from about two years experience. But again, like, yeah, I'm a massive pioneer of not judging someone on their years of experience at all. So yeah, like you said, it's about the value you could add um, to a business. Um, and then there was another one, um, other question. Um, so they said that they are a recent graduate um, getting a computer science and they really want to work on more experience in the field and building a portfolio towards getting an internship. 
Um, what additional advice would you have, Arena? Are, are there any personal experiences you can share? Very, very good question. Um, I would say, first of all, I personally think that the first uh, job to land is, is kind of very tough because you don't have many things to grab yourself uh, from, not to discourage you, or the opposite. Uh, it, we've all been there. Um, but it's it's harder than, than people talk about. And uh, the suggestions I would give would be two. First one, this is what I did. Just try to build stuff, publish stuff, make it accessible in the internet, try tools and libraries or whatever. I don't know, if you want to focus on front end, build an app in React, build an app in something else that will show people, okay, this person can uh, host something online. They can write in this using this tool or this other tool. It shows your ability to learn if you want to, I don't know, showcase your data, machine learning abilities, uh, host a Python service with a public API that's very limited so you don't get DDoS um, and people will have access to what you build. That would be the first one. And then the second one, when preparing for, for an interview, uh, it would be good to really dig deep into what product the company is building, what set of challenges uh, they have, and go to the interview very prepared with, I don't know, I, I went through your product, I found this or this bug, this is how I would fix it. Showcase that even if you don't have a professional experience, you are you are proactive, you are able to think in, in software terms and apply it uh, to this particular uh, company you're interviewing for. Perfect. Thank yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, thank you. Um, there's another question just come through. Thank you, Alex, saying, how would you quantify your impact on a business in numbers? I'm asking because it's frequently difficult to truly estimate. Every time I saw this number, like I improve Y by X percent, it always seems very weird and unclear number, which I consider to almost be a lie. And that's a brilliant question, Alex, because yeah, it is always encouraged people to say, oh, I did this and it saved the business this amount of money. So, yeah, brilliant question. I'll leave that to you to answer. It's a, it's a very, very, very good one. And one that I think it's pretty hard for anybody to answer. And why I say this, um, it's very hard to pinpoint a particular initiative that was done uh, that increased uh, a number by X percent when this number already exists. Let's say, let's take something a little bit more from the business. I want to increase my customer base by 20%. I could very well say, oh, the refactor, technical refactor I did uh, increase this because look, I, I released it to production and three months later, the numbers increased. Companies are pretty complex. There are a lot of moving parts um, that can affect numbers. Um, the recommendation I have for this is try to measure, first of all, understand what your baseline number is. It's pretty difficult to assess uh, your impact when you don't know what the number was when you started. And I see this sometimes even in OKRs. They say, oh, we're going to just put a placeholder number here. We'll increase it by X percent. And during the quarter, we'll see what's uh, feasible. Um, and that is pretty hard because you, you are missing a lot of data uh, from the point where you started. The, the only recommendation, which is what I do that I have for this is try to gather your data as soon as you finish the initiative that you think contributed to it. If you are going to wait six months until your performance review comes to say, oh, I need to have some numbers for this, you are going to um, not forget, but a lot of the context you used to have is not there anymore. And a lot of nuances in the problem that usually had a, have a very high uh, relevance to, to data. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have a, a golden answer for this one. It's 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 a pretty tough one. Just to add to that, thank you. Um, yeah, good answer. Just to add to that, um, you, as you said, it is hard to, I guess, put a number on it. Um, but I guess in terms of quantifying your impact on, on a business, like, you know, you're, uh, you've worked on a massive project for one year and you want to move opportunities. You come to write your CV and you think, oh, my God, what have I done for the last year? 
the best thing I can suggest is to literally keep a Google document that you update weekly on all the different projects. So I don't, or even bi-weekly. So when you come to the end of a sprint, just add to it all the things that you specifically done um and added to that um and hopefully that will over time it might not give you certain percentages but over time that will basically build i guess like a, a document of all the things that you specifically done over over your time thank you for your question alex um really good question and we have got another one we'll make this the last question for now because this is a really good question and then we'll, we'll come back to the rest so um Tom asked, how would you make the switch from individual contributor to lead slash manager um, is the only way to go into the role over a long one with a company? Um, he finds it seems impossible to land a managerial role with no prior experience of leading people. Good one. Yes, um, I would say it's not impossible. Um, I think for this question, I will also refer to what I mentioned before, you need to be aware of where you are working now and where you want to land your managerial position. If you are working as a, let's say, senior engineer at a 10 people startup, it will be very difficult to work for a 2000 engineering organization as a manager there because they kind of cannot vouch for your, for your knowledge. But when you try to do the opposite, it starts to become a little bit um, more possible. Let's say you are staff engineer, principal engineer, or whatever in a large organization, and you want to switch back a little bit, or you don't need to be staff or, or anything. I'm just speaking about you achieved a senior, let's say, role at a large company. You know a lot about software development. All of that knowledge about operating in this industry, about the scale, uh, of the problems can very well be uh, transferred to a smaller company that is just trying to see uh, where they need to go. They don't know how to scale uh, their teams, their technology, and they would benefit a lot from uh, from your knowledge just because of the difference in in, in the problem scale, uh, so so to, so to speak. And we also have to keep in mind that there are different levels for for managers too you can there there are companies that literally have a junior management position you might be assigned uh, a very small team and those roles are sometimes more similar to tech lead or engineering lead roles but it sets you on the engineering management ladder and it could be a, a very valid and good starting point Perfect. Thank you. Good answer. Just to add on to that little bit, and it probably isn't the best thing, Tom, but I think it is one of those things It's quite different between each company. And the thing with like an engineering manager is you have got to wear those different hats of um, having the soft skills, um, you know, with dealing with people's day to day, ish, like literally day to day issues that as an individual contributor, you really don't have, you know, you don't have the the, the daily go between so I think the way to I guess land a managerial role in, in a different company um, would to be I guess naturally the comp if this is something you're doing at your current company you're an individual contributor now and you're thinking I want to move here to a manager start as I said you've got the Google document documenting some of the things that you've done that show more of the soft skills side and how you've coached and how you've managed people because yeah, engineer manager got the technical skills, but you've got to show that you can actually coach and manage and I guess be responsible for people, not be responsible for just a, a project. Hopefully that answers your, your question um, for now. As I said, we'll definitely, I'll let you carry on now, Gonzalo, and we'll come back to more questions at the end. Yes, uh, just for the interest of time and because we have a very um, <laughs> interactive audience, I love it. I'm going to merge my, my two topics into one. Uh, it's still going to be fine. Um, I'll go with a little bit, some tips I can share with you for building your promotion case, be it to become a uh, higher level individual contributor or transitioning to management role. And uh, yes, I, I do quite agree with Lois's take uh, here. One thing I started doing some years ago was, well, I call it journaling, uh, but it's essentially 
uh, keeping a Google Doc with not every single thing you're doing, but every impactful thing every two weeks. Reflect, do a, like a small personal 15 minute retro about what you achieved and start accumulating. Eventually, when your promotion comes, you will have a lot of these things uh, written down. You don't have to remember them and you don't need to just copy paste them in your um, performance review. That would be maybe a too, too long of a bullet list, but you can start then categorizing, oh, I did this and this is quality related and it's related with this other thing or this leadership um spike I had leading this project also correlates with this other one I did six months back. And it's way easier to just write down things as they go than try to remember it uh, by years. And uh, that would be my first tip. The, um, the second thing when you're trying to, to go for a promotion is uh, alignment with your, your manager. Um, you need to understand what they expect from you at the current level and what the next level looks like. Um, I suggest to discuss this frequently, openly. If it's something that interests you pursuing the next role, make it very clear. Nobody will get mad because you, you want a, uh, a promotion. Um, and you need to speak openly about the gaps you see between what he expects from you in the next level and uh, the current one. Um, and yeah, just some of the not gaps but opportunities that might appear when when discussing it maybe he wants uh you to influence technical direction or culture more maybe he he can offer you some mentoring or coaching opportunities with new hires or people that are not performing uh, as well as you um he might if it's something that interests both the company and you give you time to contribute to open source uh, projects that a company is using or even they are not using just to build a brand uh, about the company speaking at conference or events like the one we're here uh, now or writing books or blog entries for the companies i don't know engineering or non-engineering blog also life at the name of your company um the the other tip uh, I have is to understand very well who is responsible of building the the promotion case itself and in which format. There are companies that have a specific format, Google Doc or whatever that needs to be followed and others with more flexibility. In some, it is the, the person seeking the promotion that needs to build the case and, and write it down uh, before it's presented. In others, it's just the managers, uh, depends on where you are. But ultimately, either you or your manager or both should, should put it together. It, it won't happen <laughs> if nobody uh, does it. Um, and a little bit related to um, uh, what I mentioned before about treating your skills um, as an investment portfolio, it's important that you you pick your your battles or or the projects you take, uh, because if you have ten examples, because you're journaling, you took the tip and you're journaling. Uh, you have ten examples showcasing your hard skills and none showcasing your soft skills. Um, you need to understand how to get more exposure to to these challenges. Otherwise, when performance time comes and these soft skills are, I don't know, valued by your company, uh, there will be an evident gap. So discuss it with your manager, see that they can set you up for success. Um, and one tip I, I sometimes or, or often do when I'm seeking a promotion is always have uh, the document of your career ladder open. Uh, it's just a reminder of where your goal is. Just having the tab open there is like, all right, right. I don't have to deviate uh, from the plan. Um, the um, last one I have is uh, a little bit hard to assess some time, but if you develop um, a relationship with your, your peers and even future peers, which is more important, uh, you need to understand how they see you. Um, do people in the level you want to achieve see you as an equal? Do you work in, in similar initiatives? Um, this and other rhetorical questions can be answered by having a thing with them every once in a while. Ask them what they are working on, what is next 
on their plate, what keeps them busy, and also how you can help them. Maybe you get exposure to some larger problem that you weren't uh, aware of, and you're giving something back to them. Maybe they have your back once promotion uh, time comes. And uh, just as a closing remark, um, your career is a long journey, but ultimately it starts with you. You own your career. You should be the main advocate for it. And uh, you should think about your very long-term goals. You Do you want a 30-year career? Um, if you don't plan for it, somebody else will without your interests in mind. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Gonzalo. Really insightful. Hopefully they gave everyone a bit of an overview, I guess, as I think to basically take your take your career, take a bit of ownership. Um, obviously individual contributor, like you said, you've it's not essentially individual. You are still responsible for others. Um, but I think it's the key takeaway is to have some yeah, real ownership and and take. At the end of the day, not everybody here will be will be sure. I know we had the question of somebody graduating the computer science. You probably aren't thinking about if you want to be an engineering manager, um, or you want to be a principal engineer, which is which is fair enough. Some people are here are probably a bit of a a crossroads as to which. I think my um advice would be. People approach me all the time about I'm looking for um looking for a new job um and the first thing i would say is have you spoken to your own company have you had this conversation there because i think that is probably the best thing and is to have that conversation with them and how they can help you and if they can't then yeah it probably is time to have a, have a conversation with me um someone said excellent workshop thank you appreciate that and then somebody else said that um it seems like people in the position above senior are usually either back end focused or full stack do you think there is any hope for pure front end people to get staff plus which before you intervene um Gonzalo, a hundred percent i mean i work on as i said front end <laughs> positions like for the past couple of months i've been working myself on a staff engineer role um so I think it might just be that potentially the positions you've seen uh, available are either a bit more back end or, or full stack. But if you, whoever's asked that question, looking for staff plus front end engineer, get in contact with me. I can help you. But I'll yeah, I'll leave I'll leave you over to to answer the rest of that question. Yes, um, I totally agree. A hundred percent possible. Um, I think. Two things going on here, yes, might be that there's more um, hiring happening for staff and beyond backend engineers. Maybe it's harder to fill the roles. Maybe the domain uh, needs more of them. I cannot say, but it, it surely can happen. Um, and the other point I would like to say is once you reach this staff plus and beyond, Yes, you can be focused on, on, on front and mostly like me, for example, uh, I am focused like 90% of my time, 95% of my time in front end related initiatives. There's enough problems there for me to solve. Uh, I would like to clone myself if possible. No, just kidding. Um, but I would say for, for this higher level positions beyond staff, you can focus on back end, you can focus on front end. Um, but you need to have a general understanding of the whole stack. You cannot say at, at that level, oh, yes, uh, I will do this. I'm just front end. The rest, figure it out. You, you need to be able to understand the impact of your decisions. And for that, you need a more uh, holistic view um, while still focusing on front end related or back end related uh, initiatives. Uh, I've seen it happen. I am an example of it. And I work with multiple people that, that have this profile. But yeah, and again, like you said, I guess your official title is staff software engineer and probably, yeah, we'll see see opportunities, I guess, advertised that don't specifically say front end. And um, yeah, the thing is, a lot of companies, what they do is they advertise staff engineer roles um, and it will say that they're looking for people that are either an expert in back end or front end. So, yeah, 
if you feel like you're, 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 you're struggling, as I said, reach out to somebody who's somebody like myself and can put you in the right direction. Um, we have got another question as well is somebody said, do you think there is substantial competition for roles um, above staff engineering level? I've never seen it happen. What I could, I mean, I assume that the question is healthy competition. Um, what, 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 what is evident is that as you progress in the ladder, there are few people holding uh, this position. Um, I wouldn't say it's competition. I try to flip the table and try to see them as role models. Okay, what is this? Let's say I'm staff, I want to reach senior staff. What are senior staff people doing at my company? But it's not like I will compete with them and try to do their, their work uh, faster, but rather I would like to help them mm -hmm. so that they see me as a peer. And uh, then among people that are trying to achieve um, the same position, I think the same applies to any any other role. You... Uh, or at least maybe it's just me. You you see, you compare yourself against your peers and try to differentiate yourself and try to stand out for when promotion time comes. They won't pick everybody to become senior or medior or staff. They will pick a handful and you need to differentiate yourself. Um, I wouldn't call it uh, a competition, but I don't know. Capitalism. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I get what I mean. And I guess uh, I, I don't ask this question, but potentially the competition element could come from there isn't that many roles advertised for staff engineer. Obviously, you're going to see front end senior engineer this amount of times. You're going to see staff engineer. I mean, how many times do you see a CTO um, level? Yeah posted um for you to apply to so and i don't know if that's what you mean by in terms there's there's competition um but yeah i mean there's enough space for everyone at the end of the day it's not like there's this amount of level of staff engineers available when someone's got to retire for you to take their place um no. but good question either way is there any there's no more questions in the thing now has anyone else got a question for now don't think so i'll give everyone like a second in case someone's someone's typing them um but yeah really insightful talk thank you so much hopefully um both me on and, and Jan Solo provided like pretty insightful um oh this is one more question we'll, and then we'll leave it there is um any tips on how to progress internally in a company that does not have a well-defined career progression path pretty good one to end on Yeah, I would say communicate a lot. Communicate what you want to achieve. Is it that there's no titles? Is it that there's no matrix that outlines, outlines what skills you need to progress to the next level? Um, those are, are, are different things. If, if there is titles, Try to see what your peer, your future peers are doing. Try to learn from them. Try to emulate their behavior. Understand who is ultimately responsible for giving the thumbs down or the thumbs down for your promotion. Um, maybe your manager knows about them. Maybe your manager knows what they value, even if it's not written, written down. This is where a little bit of the politics comes to play. Uh, maybe you cross paths. You, I don't know. Um, you need to understand what the company values, even if it's uh, not written down. And you also need to understand yourself what you want to be doing, because if there's not a formal career ladder, what do you want? Do you want more money? Do you want more responsibility? Do you want uh, to work with more teams at the same time? Do you want more autonomy? Uh, because maybe you can have many of these without getting promoted. And that's also one of the reasons why sometimes people don't want to get promoted. They reach medium or senior level and they're like, I'm comfortable with my paycheck. Uh, I'm good for now, at least for the rest of, I don't know, five years, I will remain here. Uh, and they are awesome co-workers. They do excellent uh, work, but they, they don't want more on their plate. 
Like, yeah, I think it's a pretty good question. And just to add to that a little bit more, I think it kind of comes back to the point of what we said is just taking some ownership and taking autonomy, having the journal aspect. Um, you know, if there's not essentially like, a, I mean, at Amicus here, right, we have an A4 document that literally says, how do you get from being a trainee recruitment consultant to being the director of the company? It's very clear to everyone from day one. Um, obviously, you have to take your own ownership but if if you feel like that's not in your current company keeping that document um and referring back to that when you have your one-to-ones you can show it to your manager and say like look i want to get to this level i've achieved these things what do you feel like i'm i'm missing um hopefully i mean it's not going to happen overnight and hopefully that will you know you can start to get have conversations with to navigate of what the path looks for you individually as an individual contributor um, within the company, even if generally it's not really well defined. Um, but yeah, another really good question. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think we'll leave it there. We've had a really, really, really good conversation. Thank you so much, Ansari, for joining the live series. Really appreciate you. Thank you to everyone that's answered their questions. Obviously, if you have any any others that you have not been answered you probably all got my email or whatever or linkedin so shoot me one um this will be it is recorded and put onto our youtube um tomorrow so if you want to come back or refer everyone else to then yeah obviously feel free also in this if anybody else feels like they like to do something like this i am more than happy and really want to like do a lot more of these if you feel like you'd like to do something a bit more technical um Obviously, I take a bit more of a backseat in that. But yeah, if anybody wants to come on one of these and do, present something technical or another topic of conversation, also more than happy to um, yeah have a conversation with you. But yeah, I think we'll leave it there. And thank you so much, everybody. Have a really good evening. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.